Welcome to the Real Estate Niche Show, a show that focuses on top real estate professionals who specialize in different niches of real estate. My name is Ben Kogut. Join me as we dive deep into the professional and personal lives of the experts of the real estate industry. Welcome to the Real Estate Niche Show. I'm your host, Ben Kogut, and today we have Wayne Ung on the show. He is a hotelier that brings over 20 years of general real estate management experience with hotel-specific management since 2013. He invests in several hotels in addition to managing certain properties within the Southwest. His properties are in Columbus, Ohio, Mobile, Alabama, Tucson, Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, he has a lot of uh, value to share with us about being in the hotel industry. Wayne, thank you so much for coming on the show. What, what did I miss in your bio that you'd like to share? Well, um, I think it's okay. I think um, I just want to congratulate you that you didn't chop up my last name. So you did a good <laughs> job. So that's great. <laughs> awesome. I think it's pretty, pretty simple enough. So let's dive into it. I'd love to hear about people's real estate niches. Um, what, what is your real estate niche and how did you get into it? Well, let's see, I got into these hotels. So, you know, these are, um, daily hotels and then we put them in with, um, extended stay. So the extended stay comes into with contractors that they need space. They don't know how long they're going to be there. They don't know how many rooms their contract could uh, change. So, um, you know, they could want eight rooms or 30 rooms. And then there's other people who are salespeople, uh, there's people between homes buying and selling uh, apartments are the same way, you know, either they're getting out of an apartment building or an apartment and it's not ready or they're waiting for another one for a contract or some damage to it. Uh, there's burnouts from houses, there's salespeople, there's people from Amazon, uh, you know, either working on the building or working for them, or there's contractors fixing the place, whatever. And then so... And then we work with governments too, because the cities need them for COVID, immigration, any kind of housing. So that's uh, temporary housing. And, you know, there's all kinds of uh, churches that we go through and groups that we meet with that, um, you know, just need help. And so sometimes they're uh, natural disasters that help help us out. So, you know, bad thing about that, but good for us. So, no, that's the thing. So you're, the, let me see if I got your niche is ho- uh, housing or hotels that um, fulfill a need for people that don't quite need to go stay at like a Marriott or something nicer like that, but they, they may need to be somewhere temporarily, but for an extended period of time. And this is, I'm assuming like at a price point that's significantly less than just going to the local courtyard or something like that. And you, you've worked with companies or bigger organizations like governments or groups that have many, many people that need somewhere to be at, you know, maybe in short order. Is that more or less well, way they to describe it? it? Well, um, what, what it is, is they just need temporary housing. So, and temporary, you know, um, we can say, um, I could say like three years, but the average stays is about probably about three weeks. We'd like to okay. say, and some people, you know, stay less. So, you know, they stay only seven days or something like that, or, you know, they say seven days and they stay for four weeks. So, um, but that's what the, that's what the weeklies are. So they come in there and they stay there and some, you know, uh, we've had managers from uh, big boys, you know, these um, restaurants, fast food restaurants. So it's surprising what um, you'll pick up and you see, because um, these people, they're not, it's not, um, it's not cheaper sometimes you know, but it helps them out because they don't have, they can't figure out their schedule. So they can go to like an apartment building, but how long are they going to stay there? They have to sign a lease and they don't know how long they're going to be. So it might be cheaper for them in the longer term to just stay over here and just, and they have the freedom to leave anytime. They don't have a contract. So they're like, you come in, you can go anytime. So that's why it is. That's one of the best perks about it is that that flexibility to come and go as they please. And so let's take a step back. How did you get into this niche? Um, well, I, I've been doing, uh, my family's been doing donut shops and uh, liquor stores. I've done uh, gas stations. Uh, we had shopping center. We had 
2007, we bought these rental houses and, uh, you know, we got like almost uh, like eight of them. And it was like, oh, it's great. Let's get a hundred. And then the price went up. So we we're like, oh, okay, let's go look at something else. We like these rental checks because it was coming through. And, you know, uh, you get these families coming in and it's like, you know what? You know, when I saw these things, uh, it's extended stay. And then it's like, oh, there's a family comes in with kids. I'm like, oh, they're going to be here forever. <laughs> so that's what when, when I saw that I was like oh that's that's really that's really good I like that so you know it's constant pay and so there's a steady income that comes in there that helps out these hotels so these are like a blue collar and they don't compete with uh, Marriott's or anything like that so you know Marriott's are for uh, you know it's just like me and you and uh, you know investors or something that's where we go and stay but during COVID where did what did we do we just stayed home you know, most of us didn't need to go out unless we needed to. And so, you know, right now those hotels are hurting, but while we're, you know, we're blue collar, you know, we're going to be, we're doing good because that's their home. And then also on the uh, daily part, they are still traveling. They still need to go to do their um, places and see their family or whatever. And so, um, you know, the business is pretty good on that side. So that's why I liked it. Got it. Nice. Uh, look, I, I want to kind of unpack some of that. Um, you mentioned that your family was in the liquor business. Uh, by the way, my family uh, was as well. Uh, the donut business. So a very entrepreneurial background. And you saw an opportunity to expand your business into this uh, real estate niche that you're that you're talking about. And so I'm curious, what was it like transitioning from, um, you know, a small business, retail business into this is an operating business. There's a lot more people involved. Um, and just kind of curious, what's, what was the mental shift for that? Well, I was like, you know, for the longest time I was doing these uh, donut shops and these liquor stores, and I always saw people going around outside and I'm like, you know, there must be something else outside there. And there must be other things to do, you know, than other doing this retail, you know? So that's why I went to look into, I went into uh, my local meetup uh, group, um, not meetup, but real estate group. And I bought everything. So, and then, you know, somebody came and showed me about this one. And so I was like, hmm, that's interesting. So, you know. You said you bought everything. What do you, what, what'd you buy? What do you mean? Oh, I was a sucker. I bought everything. You know, when you go over there, you sit back there and you're going like, all right, this guy's selling a land. You know, he's going to be a coach or something. Okay, buy that. And then he's do you selling. mean the, the real estate or do you mean like some sort of like educational materials? Yes, educational material. And he was like a coach. And then he ah. would, t- would tell you something. And then, you know, I was like, you know what? I thought about it. It's like, this is a stage to sell you everything. That's all it is. This- <laughs> so, you know, I had, I had money back then. So I was like, you know what? Let's buy this. Let's buy this, buy that. And my wife was like, you bought everything. You didn't make any money off of it. So I was like, well, you know, that's how you, that's how you learn from your mistakes. So <laughs> got it. Got it. Okay. So you were, you were going out there buying everything, but how did you learn um, when you got into, you know, owning the, these little hotels? Um, how did you learn it? Was it just, you know, trial by fire or did you have a mentor or did you read some books or listen to certain podcasts or anything like that? Um, I had a mentor and so, um, you know, I paid him and he, he just um, showed me the rose, but, you know, he told me some stuff, but, you know, when they come and tell you, it's like throwing, you know, fire hose at you. And you're like, all right, you know, give me a thousand, a million words. And you're like, I got 10 of them. So he's like, <laughs> told me a lot of things. And then, but when I went and saw the place, you know, like my first one was in Columbus, Ohio. So let's go into that one. That's, um, it's 2008. This lady goes over there and she says, hey, how much do you want the 135 unit over there? It's an old Fairfield Inn. And they said $4 million. And she said, okay, we'll be talking. And uh, fast forward four years, they give it to her for $600,000. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And, then, and then she puts in 400000 for, and then um, she gets a loan. And then uh, a year later, she gets cancer. So they said, hey, Wayne, I heard that you want, you know, you want to do this hotel? It's here, come on over here. So, you know, I work with the brand, so I'll be the franchisee. And so, you know, he goes, he tells me to, you know, let's go here, we'll paint the outside and then we'll, um, you know, we'll do the inside. And so I was like, okay, cool. 
So, you know, we go to there and we have all these problems with the city and it's like, you know what? I had a you know, liquor store and I had, you know, I dealt with the city and I dealt with the people and stuff like that. And I'm like, let's just roll with what they say. And I said, after a while, I said, you know what? I want to get rid of this one, this place here, <laughs> you know, let's make the numbers up and let's get out. And so I had to get partners to uh, finish it out. And, but I saw the numbers go up and it was shooting towards a million dollars. And so, you know, we had, uh, we had a car show, we had a muscle show and, you know, convention. So, and then there, uh, there was a three day weekend where it was a music festival. So it was $120 three day minimum. So $400 and no refunds at extended stay. So we don't, so they were there and uh, in the fall, they had the football games every, uh, every Friday and Saturday booked the whole hotel is booked. So, you know, and then we go into the slow season. And so, you know, I was remembering walking the top floor doing like, I think it was January and it was like negative 20 outside. And I'm going in there. It's like, why is it so warm? I'm asking the maintenance guy. And he goes, you know, we have customers on the bottom and their, their heaters are running. And I was like, oh my God. And so is the heater running? He goes, no, the top floor is not running. There's no heater. I was like, oh my God, we're saving, we're saving money on the top. <laughs> 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 so that's good. So I was like, that, that's good. And I was like, oh, that's, that's why we have extended stay. So we're not getting the daily, but these people are not only heating the place, but we're getting money from them during a time we would be losing money. That's great. You know, so that's when, you know, I got, you know, I gave it away to my, uh, my partners from there. So I was like, here, just give me my money. I'll be done with this one. Okay. Cause I'm, I don't want to fly up to here. It was four hours, I think from Canada from there. So it, the sun goes down at like four o'clock. <laughs> gotcha. So yeah. let me, let's unpack a little there. So you're based in Dallas, uh, yeah. which by the way, for the, for the listeners, he lives in an area called Richardson, which is really close to where I grew up, which is pretty cool. Yeah. And you've been buying uh, and managing properties that are out of state. And so you brought in some partners or you, you have partners. So how did you find those partners? And how did you divvy up uh, responsibilities? Well, I was just running it. And so they're pretty much the money partners. So they were, um, they didn't have much experience, but after I was running it a while, you know, they, they thought they could do it. I said, Hey, you know what, if you think you can do it, just give me money. I'm, I don't care if you, if you burn this place, as long as my money's done, I'm gone. Like, cause I don't want to come up to Columbus anymore. So <laughs> did you sell out or did you maintain an ownership in it as well? Well, no, I just sold my partnership. So they just gave me money. I said like, you know, um, I'll just um, chalk this up as experience and just give me mm -hmm. as much money as I can get out of this. So that was, you know, that's when I got all my experience from it. So I was like, that's good. I'll just uh, get the experience and leave it as it is. So. Let's let's talk about uh, raising capital and finding partners because that that's what I do professionally as I raise capital for commercial real estate syndication. And so I was wondering, how did you find those partners uh, to invest with you? What was tell us about that? Um, that one is just going to uh, apartment groups, you know. So it's, you just find them in apartment groups because right now the apartments are getting. Um, it's really, really competitive. So they can get a good uh, return and the whole times are taking too long. So that's, you know, how you can get these investors because these don't hold for that long. So they're only like three to four years. And then, uh, you know, we can, after, not my first one, but, you know, these ones here, it's only the first six months after you take them over and then uh, you, you do the renovations, cash flow should start around six months. So they like that. That's why they're like, because right now, especially I was just talking to somebody uh, like a week ago or something, they're going like, oh yeah, they're holding our money five, six years, seven years. So I'm like, this is, and the return is like 8%. I'm like, oh, what is that? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And so you guys are, you're holding them for a shorter, maybe three to five year time frame is sort of what the goal is. Um, and so you, and, and the, the other thing I find interesting is that you found your investors who invested in a hotel extended stay, but they were people you met in an apartment investment yeah. networking yeah. group. 
And yes. so I think that it's pretty interesting because I, you know, I, I also experienced that a lot of investors invest with me who, and we don't touch multifamily, but a lot of LP investors, they they're open to investing in other types of assets. So I think this is a really good example of that. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, I found them, um, to, uh, other places and stuff. So it's, uh, interesting because they're open to uh, investing in other things because, well, you know, the point of investing is about to make money. So if you get more money from somewhere else, they're going they're, they really like that. So that's, that's what I like about it. So <laughs> nice. And, and what other lessons learned have you had in your journey of, um, this type of niche and, and in particular, uh, outside of Texas, like, cause that it's, there's gotta be a lot of challenges with kind of overseeing real estate. That's not you know, close to home, especially like, these, like these are kind of little operating businesses within real estate. And well, so I'm just kind of curious how you've been able to manage all that. Well, um, it's like I've always, um, had people work for me. So, you know, think about my life. I've only worked for other people, I think three to four times in my whole t- home life. I've never worked for anybody. So I've always worked for myself and managed people. So when I got here with a manager, I was like, you know, um, that's the funny part. The funny thing is once you get a capable manager, they manage it themselves. They know what to do. And, um, most owners just don't give them the money to do everything to buy, uh, fix things and then buy, uh, let's say towels or something like that. That's the funny thing is like some owners just take money, keep taking, keep taking, and you don't contribute. So what we use generally do is 2% of gross goes back into the hotel. So to, to reinvest in the assets so that they continue to thrive and you're able to maintain them. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, let's talk for a second. You, you had mentioned uh, before we hit the record button that you, you own a, a shopping center, a little bit of retail. And I'm curious, what have been your lessons learned? How would you compare owning a extended stay hotels to a triple net property? Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Wow. You already said it, triple net. So, you know, you pass on all the taxes and everything to the tenant. And so that's that's what uh, I liked. I was like, you know, let's go get one of those. And then I was looking for other properties. I was like, expensive, expensive. Here's expensive. How do you find a good deal? Well, you know, it's just like anything else. If Can you find a good deal? There's five or 10 people looking at the same thing. So it's hard. So, um, you know, I saw that. I got the rent from there. I was like, this is good, but uh, we need to find somewhere that's, you know, where it just doesn't take so much capital to do it. And everything's just gone up so high. So I was like, oh, that's why we only stuck to one. But, you know, we were taking there, I was getting the rent from there. It was pretty good. So did you raise capital to buy that deal as well? Or is that just your own money? Oh, that was just our own family money that went into that one. So, you know, we, it's a long story that, you know, we, we started with one store, then we got another store that's down the street. So it's on the same block. And then on that other side, the um, eventually, I think it was five or six years later, they sold us the whole um, corner. So then um, we said, you know, we, after we got the corner, they were like, Hey, how much does it cost it to build? And they said, it costs like a million five to build. I was like, oh, okay, let's build it. So we built it. And then, uh, you know, so you got a new building, but, you know, they cut around, I think, a thousand square feet or all around. We lost a thousand square feet because they made um, the sidewalks bigger. That's when I got my, um, you know, my teeth cut with the city. And I was like, hmm, build new, but lose a thousand square feet. Hmm, what is the benefit of new? <laughs> Agree. Yeah, the, it, what a headache that is to to have to deal with some of these city uh, red tapes and all that other kind of stuff. Sheesh, got it. Oh, I mean, you know, I, the stories I could tell you. I mean, we had um, poured down uh, sidewalk, and then uh, six months later, we had another inspector come and go tear up the sidewalk and say, "Why? Because you need springs." But uh, the 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 guy it says, you know the. Um, the directions from uh, the city it says it's only where the um, cars come through. Well, he goes, I want it all across. I was like, is a car ever going to ride across there? I was like, but 
you know, my GC told me, he goes, yeah, you better not fight with them. You just do whatever he says. So, okay. 40,000 turns into a hundred thousand dollar job. So. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. My gosh. I don't know. I, I definitely would have considered fighting that one, but I, you know, I, I guess there's more details uh, to that anyway. Okay. So let's, uh, let's kind of pivot a little bit. We're going to keep moving forward. I love to ha- hear about uh, how people like to invest. So the question is, how do you like to invest in yourself? Um, well, you know, I like to um, read books, watch movies about um, things. My mind is always picking up on things so I can um, apply it to myself, either relaxing or learning. And I always think about like, it's like whatever I see applies to me, how can it apply to me? So how can it help me? So either I see some mistake and go, don't do that. <laughs> and then they're like, oh, that's some good pointers there. That's some good pointers. So it's like, you know, doing appointments or, oh, the part about email, getting replies back from people. I was like, oh, that's really good. Yeah, let's keep that. So because some people don't want to reply. That's that's a fact. <laughs> That is true. And uh, how do you like to invest in the community? Um, You know, I just go and talk to people and tell them. And I was like, I was like, tell as many people. And there's people that will come and ask me about, you know, how did you start? And I tell them and I was like, you got to start. That's the the part right there. (laughs) I was like, wow, how? Well, you know, put on your clothes, get out and talk to people. And that's the, I was like, you got to do that. And uh, you got to educate yourself and meet as many people because there's all these ideas out there. And, you know, you never know who you're going to meet that's going to help you and you just keep going. And that's how, you know, that's how you teach other people, but that's how they learn about you too. So that's what I like. Got it. You know? I love it. I love it. And how do you define the word success? Um just being happy, you know, I think it's the, the thing is about being, you're happy with what you're doing. It's not really like, I don't really consider it a job. I know that people will look at me and go, well, that guy's an expert. To me, it's like, I don't know, I've been doing it for a while or something. So it's like the back of my head. So, but the things that I do, I was like, it's not really work for me. So I was like, somebody was asking me, do you get headaches? And I was like, you know what? I haven't had a headache for like 10 years. And I was like, you know, whatever's thrown at me, I'll go, hmm, all right. Okay. All right. We got to replace all windows. All right. All right. <laughs> well, we're short, Love of, it. we're short of funds and we need to really place the windows. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> just thought it, it's, uh, it's adding value by just solving problems and, there's no limit to how many problems that need to be solved, but let's not stress about it. Let's just roll up our sleeves and figure it out and get it done. Is that more or less the mentality? Yeah. I mean, there was, um, you know, my second project was in Tucson and uh, the, the windows, like when the, I think with like, they shut the door or the wind blew, the window would break. And then, you know, they would tell me today, seven broke. I was like, wait a minute, yesterday, five broke. And then the other day was three. And I was going to, and then we got with glass company and they said that, oh, they use 33 millimeter. And they said, what's the minimum? It goes 39. I go, so this guy cut off six millimeters. He goes, why? Because he was being cheap. And said, so eventually we're going to have to replace all the windows. So we got the price down from 135. We got it down to $35. We go to Ace. The guy told us, he goes, just go to Ace and get $35 the glass, the size. And he showed us the, the, our maintenance guy to do it. And I was like, whoa, and we get better glass for $35 instead of that. I was like, okay, see, you learn your lesson from there. I was like, oh, okay, ace, get the glass. And you know, after you do two or three, you're an expert. <laughs> well, you're, you're an expert in my eyes. And uh, you know, I've never done anything with extended stay. And I appreciate you sharing all the wisdom. Uh, about that niche. I think there's just so much to be learned uh, looking at really all different types of asset classes. And this is definitely included in one of them. So I appreciate you you taking the time and, and coming on the, the podcast with me here today. Uh, as we're winding things down, um, two more questions for you. Um, 
is uh, if someone wanted to get a hold of you to, to learn more about what you do or maybe to invest, what would be the best way for someone to uh, get a hold of you? I think um, they can come to my website. So it's here, hotelcapitalinc.info. And it's Wayne at the beginning. So Wayne at hotelcapitalinc.info. And then my Got website it. is the same there. So hotelcapitalinc.info is the website. And they can reach me through there. So but nice. nice. And is, uh, are there any other uh, words of wisdom or, or parting words that you might be able to share with me and our audience? Um, I think it's really nice to meet everybody. And I hope to meet some really, it's, we're going to meet some really nice people. So <laughs> that's all I can think of right now. <laughs> That's perfect. All right, Wayne. Well, on that note, uh, it was great meeting you as well. And thanks for taking the time and, and spending a little time to share some of your wisdom and experience with us. And, and on that note, thanks everybody for listening to the Real Estate Niche Show. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Real Estate Niche Show. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest from me or the show, you can follow me on Instagram at Ben Kogut and at The Real Estate Niche Show. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.